And I am very pleased today to introduce um, our next presenter, Max Duncan. Max is a British journalist, filmmaker, and director of photography, producing documentaries and features with a particular focus on China, one of which you saw. <coughs> <laughs> and he has worked in China for almost a decade. And, um, his recent work has been featured by media including The Guardian, The New York Times, Vice, Al Jazeera, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, and Bloomberg. And he previously worked for five years as a video journalist for Reuters News Agency based in Beijing. So please join me in welcoming Max Duncan. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's great to be here. It was really, really nice to hear those initial responses from the film and to see that it resonated with, um, with, with some of your leads. Well, um, that's, that's great. Um, what I'm essentially going to do I'm basically going to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, I'll be talking about the film, obviously, uh, at length towards the end of the presentation, but I'm going to start a little bit with introducing myself, um, my own kind of career path, which may, or may be interesting for some of your, your students potentially, um, and talk quite a, little, quite a lot about China, about the particular themes that interest me, um, and, and then how I came to, to uh, this, and then potentially take a few minutes to talk about um, other ways that I see that what the main themes are that maybe could be useful for, um, for your students. So, um, that's me. Uh, so basically, um, just to start a little bit, uh, my career trajectory, I did a degree in fine art with a specialization in film, um, became very interested in, in China while I was doing my degree, and I went to learn Chinese in an evening course. Uh, and then went out for one year as a language teacher uh, with the British Council, uh, which is the kind of cultural arm of the, of the British Embassy, essentially. Um, and lived in a city called Tianjin for one year, which is a big port city near, near Beijing, um, and had one year teaching in a regular middle school and absolutely loved it. And I think all of you as educators, I, you probably understand that actually being in a school is probably the best way to understand a society full stop, right? Because you spend all day speaking to students, they tell you about their experience and you share your own experiences. So it was a, a really wonderful way to learn about China and I got completely hooked. Um, so I decided to study Chinese, so I went to Peking University, which is one of the big universities in Beijing. Um, and then I started basically as an intern at Reuters news agency in the Beijing bureau. Uh, initially, you know, my, my interest had kind of been, had been more documentary than, than news specifically, but, um, but it was a great opportunity. And also, you know, it was, it was early 2008, so that was the year of the Beijing Olympics. And so there was a huge amount of international excitement about China, um, you know, this enormous country that had almost kind of come out of, come out of nowhere to be so central on the global, on the global scene and so influential in, in so many ways, right? So, um, you know, it was this big opening up, coming out party to the world, essentially, and it was a really, really interesting time to, to be there. So I... I did that for a, I was an intern, initially unpaid. Um, there's a whole other discussion about whether that's okay or not, and I think um, opinions have changed quite a bit on unpaid internships, but anyway, then I did get paid and finally got a job early 2009 and worked there until 2014, at which point I went freelance um, for a couple more years in China. So that's kind of my trajectory. Um, so as I mentioned, you, you had the, you had the Beijing Olympics, which was this incredibly significant thing for, for China, you know, it, it really was, was its opportunity to show the world that it was not a backwards nation, that it was a huge technologically, um, technologically powerful, culturally rich, um, sportingly excellent, as we found out, um, and, and a modern nation. Um, and I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the history of, of where China had come from, but essentially this is a country that had been dirt poor through, I mean, after, after basically, I, I should start by saying, you know, essentially China was the largest economy in the world for centuries and essentially was, fell behind the West, um, 
was colonized in, in, in many parts, both by, uh, by eight foreign powers in Japan, uh, and then essentially ended what they called the, the century of humiliation, which is by at the hands of colonizers, being economically backward, and then it was uh, the communist revolution in 1949, basically, that, that brought the communists into power at the end of the civil war. But it was basically also 30 years of, of you know, while they introduced socialism, it was uh, a period of, of great poverty, basically, until the late 70s when Chairman Mao died and Deng Xiaoping, the then premier, came in and basically introduced, started to introduce economic reforms started free trade zones, allowed foreign companies to come in and invest, which set China on, a, on basically four decades of extremely fast growth, often peaking, I think, in the Olympic year at 14% GDP growth. So, you know, it's been an absolutely amazing time. Um, so during my time at Reuters, I mean, I think these were, the, these were some of the themes, you know. It was this economic growth opening up, which, which culminated with the, with the Olympics, but obviously has continued. After, after that, at the same time, you know, diplomatically, um, China has become more influential on the global stage. So diplomacy was was a large part of what we were doing. We had a lot of foreign leaders visiting, you know, a lot of handshakes, but um, a lot of state visits from. We had Obama, you know, we had Hillary Clinton came several times. Uh, a lot of that kind of thing. Domestic politics. Um, was a big focus of, of what we, we did as well. Um, you know, China is a one is a one party state with a with a secretive um, elite with a, a secretive elite leadership, but with incredible power. And obviously, what happens within the top of the leadership has a huge influence over the lives of 1.4 billion people. But we weren't always party to what was going on, so it was a lot of trying to find out. Um, civil uh, and an ethnic unrest. So. You know, China is a, I'll show a map in the next slide, but China is a huge country, in many ways quite similar to the US in terms of its dimensions. With large Western regions, you have large Tibetan areas, you have Xinjiang, this desert region, which is basically populated by um, an, a Muslim ethnic group called the Uyghur. There have been a lot of problems um, in both those regions with significant separatist movements, um, which is something that, you know, has been, that the, 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 the central authorities have been trying very hard to keep a lid on, but continue to be problems. So that was an ongoing part of our reporting. Um, human rights uh, is something that we, we were working on um, a lot. Obviously, not everybody in a one-party state is happy to be part of a one-party state. Um, and also, even people who don't necessarily consider themselves dissidents often fall foul of local government, for example. Um, so there's, there are a lot of human rights issues we were dealing with and environmental issues as well. Uh, fast growth, as I think the US has experienced, I certainly know that the UK experienced it pretty badly. Fast growth brings um, environmental degradation, health problems, et cetera, which is a huge part of, of a huge problem in China. It's a big country. Um, you know, we, there have been a, number, an, a handful of, um, well, three significant earthquakes in the time that I was, I was working there. Um, quite a lot of industrial accidents, which relates in some ways to some of the content of the film. You have a lot of factories, you don't always have good working standards, uh, health and safety, so quite a lot of that. Um, and a, apart from that, generally, um, culture, you know, China is culturally a fascinating country. It has an amazing ancient culture, uh, but contemporary, in terms of sort of contemporary culture, it's somewhere that's changing very rapidly, absorbing new ideas from the rest of the world. And out of that comes a lot of really, really interesting things. So, um, again, apologies for those East Asia experts in the room who know a lot about China already, but I thought I'd just put up a map. Um, so, as I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of parallels with the, with the US, I think. In terms of the size of the country, um, it's four times the population, which makes life difficult in many ways. But, um, you know, in many ways, you can also read, you know, you have, you have Beijing up in the north. You can kind of read for Washington, which is the political center. You have Shanghai on the east coast. You can kind of read for New York, this great big financial center of 20 million people. Um, and then, you know, all of these cities, Chongqing, for example, has a municipal population of 30 million people, you know. So 
we're talking about absolutely huge um, urban centers. Um, so, you know, I, I sort of always try and find like equivalencies. I don't know which one would be uh, Chicago. Maybe Chongqing would be Chicago, but with 10 times the population, uh, <laughs> if you can imagine. Um, and all of these urban centers are growing at unbelievable speeds. Um, so that gives you a little sense. I mentioned, you know, obviously you have Tibet, this, this very high plateau, uh, you know, where you have the highest mountain in, in the world, uh, Mount Everest, which borders Nepal. Xinjiang in the northwest is this great big Muslim, um, with this great big region with large ethnic Muslim populations, which is essentially culturally Turkic, Central Asian, um, and many people there don't feel necessarily um, sort of a, a great cultural community with, with the majority um, and Chinese, but it's a very complicated picture. Uh, so you, know, you have about 90% of the population is Han Chinese, and then you have less than 10 is, is ethnic minorities coming from a lot of them in these regions. So the area where I made the film is part of Sichuan province. It's a region called Liangshan, and it's sort of, sort of around here. Um, so a lot of different ethnic groups in the southwest of the country. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a big country. Um, so just some little pictures. Again, on the top left, that's... That's the Shanghai skyline, you know, incredible um, modernity, urban development. Um, then you have in, in the top right, this is a, a character from one of my films, but this idea, you know, of the, of the rural to urban migration, this is him. You're also somebody who has to leave their, their kids, that the rest of their family in the countryside. Look. These characters whose lives are being profoundly changed by rural to urban migration is something that I spend a lot of time focusing on. Um, I just put this in because to talk a, you know, a little bit about the culture in China, you know, I mean, here you have the symbol of, of Buddhism, which has been around for thousands of years. Here you have Chairman Mao, who was around from 1949 to 1977. And here you have a, a Ferrari or whatever it is. Um, this is all on one driver's dashboard. And, you know, I guess he was kind of hedging his bets <laughs> with, you know, but it, it's sort of, I like, I like the image because it represents a little bit. You know, the, the people, I, I feel people are very open to, many people are very open to music, and there's not necessarily one way to do things. We don't just stick with tradition. We don't wholesale adopt Western ideology or, West, or a Western concept of modernity, but, you know, we're going to take a bit of everything and work it out. Um, and then these little emperors. Um, I just, I, I put that in because, well, for a couple of reasons, there's a lot of, it's a lot of fun in China as well, and I don't think we necessarily see that in a lot of the reporting. Um, there's a lot of optimism, there's a lot of hope, which there wasn't before, so it's a very complicated picture. Um, and I, I put that one in as well, this idea of the kind of China's, you know, what, what I lived through in China, so I was there from 2006 and I, I moved in 2016, is they don't call it the Gilded Age, but I think there are many, again, there are many similarities with what happened in the US during that period. Um, so, you know, in those, in those 10 years, the GDP quadrupled. Um, the GDP per capita also kind of quadrupled. Um, 500 million people lifted out of extreme poverty is not bad. If you look at those figures, um, you know, 88% poverty in the early 80s to 3% in 2017. So, you know, that's, that's some achievement. It's huge urbanization. China now has a very strong middle class, which I don't think is, is necessarily always um, represented. Um, and, uh, you know, and you know, in the period when I was there, you know, people talked about China as this country that just copies Japanese products, copies American products. It now has the biggest telecommunications company in the world. It has the richest man in Asia. It has, it's, it's, it has sing, this single day shopping bonanza, which is basically its version of Black Friday, grossed like four times more than Black Friday last year. And this is a country where everybody was poor 30 years ago. So, you know, you, you get a sense of the kind of, uh, the kind of change which has happened there. Um, and again, I just mentioned the foreign direct in, investment, um, 180 billion last year. So China's basically in a very short period of time gone from a country which was reliant on foreign money coming in to a mass investor abroad in Europe, 
in Africa, all over the place. So it's been a really, really amazing, amazing change. Um, that, that growth has come at a, a cost. Um, rising inequality, despite the fact that, that everybody is wealthier, the, it's become a much, much more unequal country. It's more unequal than the US, despite the fact that it is a communist country, which you know still has some people scratching their heads but it's, it's a very complicated, it's a hybrid. Um, uh, industrial pollution has been a huge problem, urban pollution from, from an explosion in, in vehicle um, use is, is a big, big problem, and it's something that's really mobilized the middle class to force the government to do something about it. That's been a very interesting issue. Corruption had, has been a huge problem, a massive problem, but... Um, but at the same time, the, the new administration, or not so new anymore, five years now under Xi Jinping, has cracked down on corruption in a big way. I think basically feeling that their legitimacy is threatened by the amount, the levels of corruption that you've had in China. So um, human rights, um, uh, again, I mentioned before, and I'm getting a little repetitive. Censorship that you're, you're probably all aware of, um, that's not necessarily a direct cost of growth, but at the same time, the opening up that... that um, you know, that China's growth has afforded means that you have, you know, you have 700 million people using the internet and you, they have to control the, the, the speech that's going on on the internet because it's a very powerful platform for people to, to talk about grievances that, that, that the authorities don't necessarily want to talk about. And I think, you know, what, what, um, what we were talking about in the film, I think, is this, the psychological and, and social impact of growth. A lot of people are happier than they used to be, but it's taken a, a toll, it, for example, with this family, on family structures, on interpersonal relationships, and um, all of that is very significant. As you can see on the left, I put these two pictures. That's the Forbidden City in Beijing, you know, one of the most amazing architectural uh, wonders of, of the world. Um, and there it is in the smog from the same view. So it's, uh, they've, got a, they've had a lot to deal with. Um, I thought I'm going to talk a little bit here, basically, when I started at, at working at Reuters, um, the news agency, and you know, started trained up with a camera and started going around shooting things. Um, and this was a story that I think, um, for me, you know, that moved me a lot and really made, um, made me want to continue doing journalism, doing documentary. And I think it deals with some of the, the issues that I've been continuously interested in. Um, you know, one is in the context, I think, of, of this, this kind of gilded age. You know, it was a, a time of, of great wealth, um, but also a time of, of, uh, of real inequality. And, you know, uh, slightly a time when there's, there's so much money going around um, for the wealthy, and there's, there's so much drive to move forward that sometimes things aren't necessarily done properly. Um, and this, this case, basically, what I'm... What I'm going to do is just play it and I'll talk over it a little bit because I should make a side point, is that the way Reuters works as a news agency, which I'm sure most of you are aware, but, um, or many of you are aware, but basically the, the video product that we made at Reuters, um, essentially we go and do an interview as, as PBS or CNN would. We go, we, we shoot our kind of B-roll, we try and tell the story through images, we do our interviews. But we don't actually do a voice package or anything like that. We just basically cut a rough edit, and with a, which has a script that explains a story and has a shot list as well, which says shot one, man walking, shot two, man picks up phone, for example. And then we provide um, translations of all of the interviews so that basically it's like IKEA furniture. The client, PBS or CNN or whoever, they take it, they say, OK, chop, 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 chop. I'm going to have that bit. That we might have put out a three, four minute edit, of, a loose edit, but they might chop it to a minute and a half, do whatever they like with it, get the facts wrong, mistranslate it. Well, no, uh, uh, but we basically give them a kit with which to make a news report, but it almost never says Reuters. I think CNN does because they have a special contract, but basically you don't really know it's Reuters. So there was a point where I think it was 40% of the video that you were seeing on the BBC, for example, was from the agencies. So Reuters or Associated Press or Agence France Press, AFP, um, are basically providing a huge amount of the international coverage. Um, 
And in the case of this story, basically Reuters, we were the only, I think we were the only international media on the ground. So everybody who was using it for international media was using our footage, basically. So um, basically what had happened is this is in the very far northwest of China. There was a mine, um, a mine explosion right up near the Russian border in November. And in the end, over, I think it was 114 people finally died, um, all men underground. And they had, it was decided by the, the state, um, I can't remember exactly what the organization is called, but the, the organization in, in, in charge of, um, of disaster prevention had decided, had, had decided basically that there was human error involved in the explosion. Someone had basically been asleep at the switch. There were very high levels of gas in the pit that weren't detected, and then there was this explosion. Um, and so I traveled up there from, from Beijing um, to go and cover it. This is a, a relative of one of the, the men that died. Um, oh, let's see if I, oh, there we go. So uh, essentially telling us that, uh, you know, that, she, that her relatives are in there. And what, what I think is interesting for me, has been interesting about reporting on um, disasters, is that a disaster is never just a disaster. There's, you know, whether it's the, whether it's the way that it, the, the reason it happened or the way it was, um, the, the, the way it was responded to, you can see a lot about a, a, the way the government works. You can see a lot about the way society works. And in this case, um, let me just go through. Whoops, hold on, sorry about that. I'm just trying to work out this thing. Oh, no. oh, now we have to watch that again, sorry. Um, and what happened in this case, which was very telling, is basically on the third day, oh, these, so you can see, so I went and visited some of the, the victims who survived. Pretty shocking stuff, sorry about that, guys. Um, and, but what was, what was interesting um, about what happened here is essentially on the third day, the wives of many of the men who'd been killed basically came out for answers because the people at the mine just weren't picking up the phone. So you can imagine if, if your husband's died and it's been three days and, and nobody's picking up the phone. Um, this, is a, this is a state run mine, I should mention. You get pretty, pretty angry. So basically these women came out um, demanding answers. And essentially what happened is that the local government hired these goons to, to, to try and shut them up. So, um, you know, very, very dramatic, um, very upsetting scenes. And, you know, we'll see now, you know, one woman who wanted to talk to us was essentially being prevented talking to us by, by security. Um, you know, you don't know who these guys are, but they're essentially, they're hired. But, um, basically, yeah, I mean, that, that's an you, you never find out exactly who they are, but gen generally there are people who local governments employ to, to, um, to do their kind of dirty work. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I was quite, I was moved by this in the sense that, you know, if your family members just died, you're not given the dignity to be able to complain about it or even speak to anyone about it. Um, it tells you quite a lot about how some of the local governments are operating. Um, and uh, so and what I did as a, as, a, as a kind of a fourth day story was to go and speak to, to try and find out who these men were, what was their background, why were they doing it? You know, why would you go down and risk your, your life in such a dangerous, in such a dangerous, um, uh, with such a dangerous job? And obviously, you know, a lot of the answer to that is, is, um, is poverty, of course. Um, so I went and met these two guys, Mr. Liu and Mr. He. Oh, let me just cut to that a little bit. I, I mean, this is just to show, like, you know, the kind of level of, of poverty there is that there are people who spend all day long picking bits of coal from the roadsides that fall off the back of trucks just to heat their houses, you know. Um, so I went and met these two really, really lovely guys Mr. Liu and Mr. He, who were both migrants from another part of the country, um, and just basically did a simple story, which, which you know, is, is not necessarily newsworthy, but for me is um, something that I think is important: is to, to actually find out who these people, who these people are, and what are their motivations. So, um, I spent a few hours with these guys, just just in the in the house where they live in, 
basically learning about their lives. And um, so here, Mr. Khe is basically saying, um, you know, that the money that you can make down the mine is two to three times as much as you can make on the construction site or or on the factory floor. You know, what, who wouldn't who wouldn't take the risk? Um, and then I spoke to this guy who was a you know a really really lovely guy um, who who essentially says, look, I have both children and also parents to take care of. What, what am I going to do? Um, so that was a that was a, a a project for me that I think you know as as I mentioned you know you you learn a lot about a society and how it operates and and the state and how it operates by the response to this kind of situation. Um, and I also, you know, I feel like while these people aren't manufacturing products for the rest of the world, as, as with the family in, in the piece, that we, in the, the film that you watched earlier, you know, I, I think China is the, is the manufacturer of the world. And I think it's important for a global audience to kind of understand, understand how, how this works. I, I covered another, um, another story in a, in a chicken processing plant where 200 women were killed when basically there was a, an explosion in the, in the cold storage unit of this chicken, pro, chicken processing plant and somebody had locked the door of the factory because they didn't want people going out to talk on their phone or have cigarettes. And so basically all of these people died because they just, somebody just decided we're going to keep the door locked to stop them going out. And you know, it's an obvious incredible failure of health and safety that wasn't being regulated because the local officials were bribing I mean, the, the people at the plant were bribing the local um, health and safety people to just leave them alone, basically. So, anyway, <laughs> happy times. Um, I'll talk a little more, more briefly about this. Um, they, I, I did a lot of work in, um, in Tibetan areas of China in, in the far north west. Um, not in Tibet itself so much because that's actually closed off to foreigners. But, um, and I wanted to just show you... Um, no, essentially, uh, this is a very remote, very high, very beautiful region. Um, and as many of you are probably aware, you know, it's disputed over whether or not it should be part of China. Um, many Tibetans feel that it shouldn't be. Um, the, the vast, vast majority of, of Han Chinese people believe that it certainly should be and certainly has been um, for centuries. So there's a, there's a, it's basically essentially disputed. Um, you see images of the of the Dalai Lama in many places where you go. Um, despite actually, there's been a lot of reporting that you can't see his image anywhere. It's actually it's not true. You have been able to see it um, in quite a lot of temples. This was one time when we went for the Tibetan New Year, and they um, the local men hung up this huge tanka painting from the side of this uh, side of this mountainside. So. Um, I mean, it's, it's an absolutely amazing place. And to be able to show a little bit of the culture, I think, is, is you know, ser serves a purpose, I think, in, in widening the, the, the debate about the, the issue. You know, there's a high security presence in, across all of these areas. Um, we used to do a lot of sneaking around, um, filming through cafe windows, etc. cetera. Um, but that was something that I spent quite a lot of time doing. I think I'll skip to, uh, these, are, these are images from riots that happened in Lhasa in 2008. Basically, there was a large, um, there, well, depending on how you define it, but there was a, a significant uprising in Lhasa um, with monks and local people basically smashing and looting local shops um, in protest about the, the in protest about the, the situation there. Um, I think both, both economic but also um, the, the, the political situation. Um, you can see. Anyway, I might just skip through this. And another. Oh, but at the same time, you know, and this is the great one of the great stories of China. You know, they've built a railway all the way from Beijing to Lhasa um, that goes up to over three thousand meters, which is how many feet? Ten thousand feet. Um, which which people said they couldn't do. Um, because engine, in terms of engineering, it was too difficult, and they did. You know, and this brings economic prosperity to the region. It also brings a lot of migrants from from the interior. You know, levels of literacy and education in an area like Tibet are much much higher than they used to be. So, it's it's a very complicated picture. Um, and I wanted just to talk a little bit about this. So, later in the um, 
in the year I went to cover this, an earthquake which happened in an area called Qinghai, which is on the Tibetan plateau, but it's not within the area administered as Tibet. And, um, and it's, I think it's another example of, of how reporting on a, on a disaster or, or a crisis um, tells you a lot about the system, about the society. So um, went to cover this, um, and 2,000 people roughly died in this, in this earthquake. So it was a great tragedy at the same time, you know, China is this incredibly, it's, it's got an incredibly organized administration, it's got an incredibly organized disaster relief operation. So um, it was quite incredible the, the, the speed with which the authorities mounted this, this rescue operation and, um, and disaster, general disaster relief. But it was, of course, um, tragic. And what was also very interesting, though, was that you, you ended up with, um, so this, this is actually a little shocking, but basically um, a lot of people brought the, the bodies of those that had been found to the local monastery instead of giving them to the authorities. And so you ended up with, with um, thousands of these monks in their saffron robes basically coming from all across the Tibetan plateau to, to mount their own kind of counter-relief effort. So you had these two opposing, um, you had these two opposing kind of official relief and then the monks relief working at this earthquake. And um, what then happened basically on the fort, so you see you've got these kind of monks, you know, completely untrained, trying to pull people out of collapsed buildings, which was quite, a, an, quite an amazing, quite an amazing thing. And on the, on the fourth or fifth day, basically, um, a lot of these, a lot of the monks um, took the bodies that had been brought to the temple and held a mass, a mass cremation on the mountainside, which was, um, which was absolutely shocking. I mean, it was shocking, but you can't, it was also amazing. You know, you never would have imagined that something like this would, <laughs> would, would be happening, um, that there wouldn't be any kind of official, um, there wouldn't be an officially, officially organized uh, mass burial or mass cremation, that this was all being organized by the monks um, and the local people. But it was, it was probably the, just about the most um, sort of amazing, shocking, um, but in some ways inspiring thing that I've ever seen in my reporting experience, because it was, it was um, you know, it's quite brutal, but at the same time, I think a lot of people who came out to, to pray for those that had died actually very much felt like this was the right thing to do. And, you know, in Tibetan tradition, in Buddhism, the body is just a vessel. Um, and it was a very moving, but quite a shocking, um, shocking thing. So those are just the two things from my time reporting at Reuters um, that I wanted to, to share with you. I think they express some of the, the themes that are happening in, in China. Um, during that time, I also started to work. I'll just brush through this briefly because I'll concentrate on China. But um, I started to work outside China a lot more. So I traveled to North Korea, um, to Mongolia a lot, Thailand, uh, Taiwan. Uh, and then increasingly, I also traveled a little bit outside of Asia. So this is one of the great things about working for an, a news agency is you get to travel around quite a lot. Um, when I left Reuters, I put together a, a showreel, which I, is just over two minutes. Um, I apologize in advance for the promotional nature, but when you go freelance, you have to kind of promote yourself a bit. So um, I'm just going to play that. It's kind of an overview of, of those five years working there.
I'm sorry if any of you are feeling like him. Um, <laughs> I, I realize also, actually, that I should probably speed up a little bit. I was um, basically, I produced that show when I decided to, to move on from Reuters, and there are a number of regions, uh, reasons. I, I just want to say quickly, you know, I think an agency is a fantastic place to work. It's a great place to get training. Um, because it's an agency, I think there's a real, like, rigor to, and uh, a, a focus on accuracy, objectivity, which I think is a, is a really positive thing. Um, you know, I'm very grateful to have worked there. I'm going to skip over a little bit. Um, but I, at the same time, you know, it does get quite repetitive to cover a lot of press conferences as well as, um, as, well as things that you think are important. Um, press conferences can be important. But um, it's also very, very fast-paced. You never get to work on anything for more than a couple of days, basically. Um, so after, after a while, I found that it, it got quite um, sort of a bit disappointing in that sense, limited scope for visual creativity. So I went freelance. That's my drone. Um, we have a lot of fun together. Uh, but, and I think I'll skip over this, this a little bit because we're, we're short on time. But um, essentially, going freelance isn't easy. In China, you need to be accredited. You have to have a visa because of the way that the, the state works. So I basically persuaded The Telegraph, which is a British paper, to give me a visa. And um, I did occasional work for them, but not much. And otherwise, I could, I could do my own thing. Um, so for, for me, you know, I, I think uh, visual, visual, a visually creative approach to, to journalism for me is something that's quite important. Um, so, you know, I use this this opportunity to, to do some stories, which I which I could tell in an, in an interesting way. Um, uh, I think I will skip this. Um, that, and I started doing a lot of kind of short online online video for traditional media that have gone online, so Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, Guardian kind of thing. Um, I think because of time, I might just skip over this uh, because we should leave 20 minutes or so to talk. Um, so these are just an example of some of the pieces I did. Um, this is a piece on, well, going back, this is a, a, a doctor who was swapping mouse's heads, um, which was pretty intense. Um, but, but an example of kind of how China is becoming so scientifically very, um, very uh, advanced. Uh, I'm going to give this a miss as well, I think. Um, but I did quite a lot of more visually creative things. This is a piece by the, about, about the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei um, for The Guardian. Uh, uh, okay. Um, this, I, I, this was a long piece I did for the Financial Times, which is about many of the similar issues that you saw in the... Um, in the, uh, the piece about the left behind children, essentially it's about um, how the changes in Chinese manufacturing are causing a lot of workers to, to return to their, to their hometowns. So again, dealing with, um, with issues around migration, urbanization, which I think is something that I find fascinating. Um, ignore that. I am gonna show you this one because um, I think just from a, from a technical point of view, um, it's quite interesting, which is the first time I worked on an interactive report, where basically you're not using video in a linear, traditional way to tell a, a story, but rather using video and text together in a, in a multimedia format in a way that, that I, find, um, I find quite interesting. So this I was working together with it. Ooh. Oh, just purely from the perspective that I think it is quite interesting, using, um, using text and, and video together looking at sort of using video as... Hmm, we might have an internet problem. Um, so I'll move quickly, but essentially this was a piece about, um, about black lung disease, which is um, something that, that um, a lot of miners in the UK used to get um, when, when mining was a big deal, but um, it's a huge problem in, in China. Um, so again, sort of looking again at some of the, of the, um, the challenges that come with, with, um, with fast economic growth, um, but I shall. Um, but anyway, the, the, the main point being really um, that it was really a great experience to go freelance and be able to work in, in new ways of visual storytelling that, that, were hap that have happened basically with the onset of the, of, of the, that the internet has created basically. Um, and so coming finally to, the, to this final project. So um, down from the mountains, this was funded um, very kindly by the Pulitzer Center. The travel was funded. Um, and I did four different versions of the piece. Um, so 
one, a short news, -ish, more news version, which focused more specifically um, on on this issue of left behind uh, children. You know, another another sort of negative side effect of, of fast economic growth. I did a, the long version, 24 minutes for China file. I did this 14 minute version, which you've just watched um, for both. I I had that on the Atlantic and Aon, and you know, I came essentially. I came to uh, this idea because having lived in China for a long time, you know, this was this is not a new issue to anyone in China in, in the sense that it's it's something that's sort of understood as as al almost it's been understood as a as a necessary um, side effect of rural urban migration of economic growth um, that you have nine million children who are who are living without their parents in the countryside now many of them are living and the, the majority of them are living with relatives often grandparents. But especially with some older children, there's a much, I think there's a much l looser, looser interpretation to the way that they're being, they're being um, the, the grandparents or uncle and aunt are taking care of them, and some are basically living just by themselves. So it was an issue that that um, that had interested me for a long time, and I think also, you know, there's a tendency always to focus on the news, and and I think especially with with a, with the amazing things that are happening in in China, what actually is the day-to-day -day things, it's, it's easy to, to miss them. And actually, sometimes you know, have to realize that the most significant things that are happening are not the news so much as the, the everyday, right? So um, I wanted to do a story on, on, on this issue. And I, I heard about this um, particular ethnic group, the Yi, who come from this area, Liangshan, in southwest China, as I pointed out, where many basically working age people from the Yi group had started going um, in large numbers to the, to the eastern coast in China to work in factories, but relatively recently. Um, whereas you know, many Han Chinese have been, have been migrating for work since, since the, the 80s, 90s, basically. Um, and you know, I thought they're, they're, they're an ethnic group that not that many people outside of China are aware of and inside China, even though they're, a, they're 8 million strong. I don't think they're a particularly well-known um, group, but they are culturally very interesting as well. Um, so I, I sort of started researching in this area. I found a, a very good um, fixer producer who helped find me this, this family. Um, and so I got in, got in touch with them and went and, um, and as sort of as soon as I met the kids, I felt very strongly that uh, this was a family that I would like to follow because I, I think most people, whether they like the piece or not, I think most people respond to, especially the two girls, and especially the oldest girl, Wang, Wang Ying, I think is quite, a, is quite a powerful character. And I think her, her kind of emotional struggle was pretty apparent from the, from the beginning. So she, she you know, I, I felt strongly that this would be an interesting family to, to follow. Um, and I very much wanted to make it an immersive, you know, an immersive experience rather than um, rather than a, a classic news report where you lay out all the information clearly um, and you have a voiceover and everything else. Because I, I feel quite, I, I, I felt and I do feel quite strongly that as much as possible, if you can allow people to tell their own stories in a way that will engage an audience, I think, um, and hopefully, especially with a younger audience, to hear people describe their own lives rather than have it told to you, um, I think can be. Um, can be quite more powerful, so I'm just gonna. Um, so what what this shorter version didn't focus on so much was was their identity as an as a different ethnic group, and the longer version I think focused quite a lot on that. Um, they have a really fascinating culture. This is the torch festival celebrations, which didn't make it into the shorter version, but I, I thought I'd just stick in a few photos here. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, the the identity of this family as, a, as an ethnic minority, I think makes, makes their struggle particularly, particularly difficult because of the language barrier that the parents face, because um, they haven't be, they've, they're less integrated into sort of main, quote unquote, mainstream society. Um, but, uh, and I've just jotted down a few themes that I think, um, you know, you guys obviously have had your, your responses to it. I just jotted these down quickly um, that I think are interesting things to think about with the piece potentially, which is, so, you know, one being this kind of cost of progress. Um, again, you know, the reflections of kind of the American Gilded Age or the British Industrial Revolution. You know, a lot of people make a lot of sacrifices um, for economic betterment. And, you know, how much, um, 
I mean, well, do, do they have a choice? But then how much are those sacrifices that we should be making? It's a question. I think it's a question to ask. Um, that obviously relates to this idea of parenting, um, this notion of parenting and family. Um, I think social inequality is obviously um, something which is, which is in there um, as, a, as an issue. You know, the, the, the parents are, are choosing to go out and in an, in a, an attempt to give their children a, a better life. But, um, but a lot of that is because society is moving fast, it's changing so rapidly, and you have no choice but to, to catch up. Um, and this is basically, for them, they see it as, as sort of the only way. Um, education, obviously, some people touched on, you know, there's a strong, um, in, in the interviews with both girls, there's this strong issue that education is what's going to get me out of here so that I don't have to live like my parents. And perhaps if I have children, you know, I can raise, I can live with them. Um, and education is, is, I think, is the, for them, they see it as one of the keys. You know, how it's, it's, it's not easy to, to get out of poverty and, and move up, but, um, but they, they have determination. Um, I mentioned gender because, you know, in this case, obviously, it's the older girl who's been, had the responsibility put on her shoulders. She's the one who has to sort of act as, act as mum. And... I think that's often the case in, in many rural many rural societies. Um, uh, ethnicity, I, I, I touched on just now. You know how much does their their status as an ethnic minority affect their ability to to integrate um, with the language problems and everything else? And this was I just put what is China? Um, you know uh, this is uh, as Farid mentioned this. You know I think a lot of people have this idea um, in the West suddenly of China as this fantastically rich powerful nation that's that's which which it is it's a huge you know, it's a huge economy it's very very influential in the rest of the world but but obviously there's still real poverty and it's a you know it's a lot for any government to deal with without having to deal with 1.4 billion people um, so it, it's something to think about um, and then I mentioned the cost of your headphones which was something that one of our colleagues pointed out um, I don't know exactly where the headphones they were producing are going. It was a, it was a Korean company. They wouldn't let me anywhere near um, video inside the factory, sadly. Um, but, um, but it's something to, to think about. Um, who makes your headphones all those miles away? Um, and that is that. Sorry I went on a bit. <laughs> We've got about 10 minutes, a little over that, for questions. Okay. Cool. I was curious, when you were uh, filming the women whose uh, husbands were killed in that mining incident, what, uh, I mean, I had, like, were you allowed to be filming there? Were you clearly filming there? Were you, you know, secretly filming there? Was it okay? So, um, basically, for generally the rule for filming in, in China, after the, before the Olympics, basically, the, the government, um, as part of the agreements with, with the, the International Olympic Committee, was that they would allow foreign reporters who are accredited to report anywhere in the country, except for Tibet, um, which is a, you know, it's a special region. But, um, and that hadn't always been the case. You know, as China was coming out of being a very closed communist society, it was basically impossible for journalists to report in many places. In this case, basically, we're, what, being up there reporting, we're totally within our legal rights to report um, and that, that wouldn't be disputed. The problem is that sometimes when you get on the ground and if you're doing something that the local government isn't happy about, then they're going to come and, and try and get in your way. Now, I mean, you can see in that example, you know, that the, um, the, the, the women wanted to, to express to us. And, and in, in that case, you know, the, the, the Chinese media in that case actually weren't allowed to report on it. So... While what we're doing isn't necessarily being shown in China, we, we were actually pretty much the only, the only outlet for them to be able to convey some of their anger. Um, so while well, you see the guys kind of pushing us yeah. around, um, that's basically the local authorities not wanting you to be there. But they're also, I mean, I think China it actually is relatively safe in the sense that um, the, the higher authorities don't want trouble. They don't want diplomatic trouble. So, so it's very rare that you're not going to get kind of <laughs> clobbered over the, the head. Um, but people just try and stop you filming. That, that happens, yeah. I hope that was... Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So they were kind of like, okay, to stop the women from talking, but you were able to record. 
Yeah, I mean, they try and stop us filming as well, but it's never much more than a push and a hand over the, the lens. It's, it's not usually kind of very violent, yeah. Um, a lady at the back had a hand up first. Yeah, I really enjoyed your down from the mountain. Mm -hmm. It looked a lot like a graphic film. Mm -hmm. Can you show me what that means? Okay. And I was thinking actually, do you speak Cantonese or Mandarin? Uh, Mandarin, yes. Yeah. So, these uh, people, your interlocutors, they couldn't speak Mandarin. So the, in this case, the children do. Um, this is another interesting generator. So the children do, but the parents don't. Yeah. Did you need assistance or translators? And how long did you spend time with them? Because I mean, this was a lengthy period. It's like you had to follow them to have to spend mm -hmm. some time with them. So basically, um, I was working with a local fixer producer who's from the region, um, who's also an anthropologist. And she basically helped me find the family through, through non-government organizations there. Um, and she was doing all of the communication with the, with the parents and also doing all of the translation for them. With the, with the speaking to the children, you know, I can ask the questions and understand the answers and, and communicate with them fine in, in Mandarin. And so it was, you see it more in the longer version but it was quite a lot of filming so basically I went to visit the the children in the countryside on three separate visits um so two visits and then the third was so two visits basically to them and then I went to visit twice the parents in Guangdong province and the second time I came back with the with the mother so she, she traveled across the country. One thing I realized when watching is that it doesn't make very clear, but you know, she's traveling on a bus a, a thousand miles. Um, it's, a, it's a long way back to her kids. Um, and we went back, and then that final time we were with the whole family together. So it was sort of five separate trips over the course of three months or so. Yep. Um, gentlemen at the back. Um, do the people own land or lease land? So, I think you have a, I think you have a 70-year lease on, on land. So, but it, it's, I think it's complicated in the sense that in certain villages it's commonly owned land, um, which is owned by the, the, the village, which is basically like controlled by the local government. Um, and then you have a, you have a long-term lease basically on, on land. Is that, that's how I understand it. Is there a tax? Um, there was a tax and they cancelled it in about 2008, the agricultural tax, um, which was basically, they cancelled it essentially to try and, to try and give um, farmers more, um, more possibility to, to sort of uh, economically better their situation. So there had been a tax and then the tax was, was removed. So I think as, as it stands, I don't think there's any tax on agricultural land. Yeah. Thank you. Um, lady here. Um, I know the parents talk about they cannot move and bring the children to mm -hmm. do whatever they work, but even if they could, would they be allowed to go to schools? Because I was reading about how if you have more than one child, they will not shadow. Right. Uh, so, could they do that? So, there's a number of issues there. It's pretty complicated. Um, First, on the one-child policy, um, which no longer exists, they dispensed with it in 2010, I think. Um, basically, ethnic minority groups were allowed to have more, more children. So um, I think as a way of kind of keeping everybody happy. And also rural communities, um, even with Han Chinese populations, they were often allowed to have two. Um, if the first child is, was a girl, you were allowed to have a second child, basically to avoid um, female infanticide, which used to be a, a big, big problem in China, not so much anymore. Um, so, and as with the issue of whether they can bring them with them, so there's a system in China called the Huko, which is household registration. It's sort of like an internal passport because China is such a big country. Basically, your Huko is bound, just as your nationality is bound to the US, your Huko is bound to the area where you came from. So basically, you have your Huko and it entitles you to free healthcare, um, free education, um, in the region where you come from. But if you move to somewhere else, you're no longer entitled to those things. Um, so basically, that's a major barrier to, to rural, uh, rural parents bringing their kids with them to the cities is because once they turn up in the cities, they can't put their kids in a regular middle school. They would have to put them in a special private school for migrant workers, basically, 
um, where they have to, they obviously have to pay more. They're not entitled to free healthcare. Um, so if your child gets sick, you know, what do you do? If, they, if you don't have the economic means, you can't pay for them. You can't afford for them to be treated. So those are things that have kept a lot of people out of the cities. And it's very, it is very much an intentional policy in this, because you have this huge population and, economic, you know, and the economy growing so fast, you don't want everybody to move to the most desirable cities at the same time because then you have a population explosion and those cities just can't handle it. So um, it's essentially a way of, of controlling the movement of, of population. Um, a lot of people do bring their kids to the, the cities, but it costs them a lot of money. Um, and usually they don't have as many kids as this family, so it's, you know, it's often it's one, or two, it's one or two children, which is potentially manageable. But for most rural families, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty difficult. Yeah. I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about the opposite of that. So and in 2007, when I was in Lhasa, the mm -hmm. humification mm -hmm. of so much of the Western Territory, so is the government still today, is it there's still mass migration, or forced migration, I guess, of Han Chinese? Mm -hmm into some of the more frontier areas? I, I don't think, as I understand it, I don't think there's any forced migration. Um, there, may, there, may, there was certainly um, resettlement during, um, I think, before the sort of end of the, the 70s. There's definitely a large, there's a, there's a significant movement of migrants to, um, to these western regions. I don't think, I, I'm pretty sure it's never forced. I'd be very surprised if it was forced, but it's encouraged. Um, and I think, and people moving from the interior often have sort of better economic means to set up shop, set up small businesses, or go and work for, for, for companies there. So um, I'm pretty sure there's, there's, uh, there's no force at all. So if, Han, if a Han Chinese from the East Coast is going to relocate to Yeramchi or to Lhasa, mm -hmm. they don't have to go like their cold they? They, they still take that with them, right? I mean, are, aren't they more protected by the government? Let's see. You know what, I'm not actually, I don't actually know how the hukou system works for that situation. Presumably, I mean, one, one difficult thing about the hukou is that basically you can transfer a hukou. It either costs you, but it depends. It's a, basically, it's a very um, tailored system. So if you want to move to Beijing, Shanghai, or Shenzhen, or certain high desirable areas, they basically don't want you to move there. They'd rather you move to your local city or you move to another, um, another urban center, which is a less desirable area. So it may well be that when you get people moving from the interior out to Tibet or Xinjiang or wherever, it would be much, much easier to transfer a hukou because they simply like, don't, are quite happy for you to move there. But, but I actually... When I was here, we discussed that a little bit, and it was part of the incentive. It was. You know, it was part of the government incentive. So that yes, they would give you an easy... Yeah. So they still have, they continue to have the access to the same. Uh, I was wondering, I understand as a journalist, um, kind of are tasked with being objective when you yeah. tell a story. And I, and I definitely feel like this film was objective. But just on another side, maybe if you would be willing to share what would be like a call of action. So as a classroom teacher, I can share this information and put it in front of my students and mm -hmm. look through, through a lens and maybe ask them some questions to help mm -hmm. them develop their thoughts. But if you had a call to action or if you were going to put this in front of some young people, yeah. what would you like the outcomes to be? Okay, just a question about um, the uh, like ob objectivity. Um, ha sorry, can you just explain... Um, like I, 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 totally, I understand certainly why within that film there's question, there would be potentially questions about objectivity. I guess, um, how does that relate to a call to action? No, so I don't think, I, I think that the film you know, was very objective and just kind of told their story mm -hmm. and gave them an opportunity to share. But, I mean, when you put it out there, people can do what they want with it, but what would you want to see? What would you like to see as the outcomes? Is it just, hey, know these people and their story, uh -huh. or is there more to okay. it, more depth? Oh, okay. Um, I would definitely... Um, I think you know, this, this isn't necessarily the principal goal, but I think it's something that would make me really happy if it is successfully, if, if like American high school kids are successfully associating with the challenges faced by these, um, these kids, then, and they, they sort of, um, if they are relating to them on a, on a kind of equal level, despite incredible cultural, geographical, whatever differences, um, that's something that, that makes, would make me very, very happy. Um, so I guess any kind of, any kind of question that, that sort of 
encourages that even more. Like, imagine yourself in that scenario. How would you, um, what choices would you make? How would you feel? Um, I guess that's, I think another thing um, that would, that I would um, appreciate is, I think, a different understanding of what, of what China is as a, um, certainly not that they have the impression that, that everybody in China is, is poor. But, um, you know, as you saw in the figures, it's, it's a, it's a small proportion of the population um, that is now in extreme poverty. But at the same time, you know, it is this huge nation that um, people think of as very powerful and, and increasingly people think of as very wealthy. And I think if, uh, if an American students can understand a little bit some of the complexity of, of China and what it has to deal with as a, as a country, um, then I think it might change the way they, they, they think about it and potentially the way the US relates to it a little bit. That was a, not a very clean answer, but um, I'm this lady here. Uh, how is uh, crime treated in, in China? Usually with poverty you know, here in the United States. Yeah. You know, uh, you get arrested which yeah. how, how is it treated in China? I'd say, like, first, one of the really great, great things about living in China is that the general levels of violent crime are incredibly low. So, very, very low. Um, so, I, you know, I lived there for 10 years almost and worked all over the place and I never got robbed, I never got mugged, I never really was even threatened by anybody who wanted anything from me. In some, in, in some situations like reporting, you get guys who want to stop you doing your job, but I never, there's not a single place where I've walked at night in the whole of China, really, where I've actually felt scared, almost. Um, and that actually, I've discussed this a lot, even with female friends, um, they feel very safe. Um, that's not to say that there isn't crime, there's definitely, there's, there, there is crime, there's pickpocketing, there's like a lot of economic crime. Um, there, you know, we had a huge, huge, um, a huge corruption problem. Um, there's a lot of, there has been a lot of fraud. Um, but in terms of violent crime, petty crime, uh, the levels are pretty low. So how is it dealt with? I think, I think it's dealt with, I'm going to say this and then I'm not going to be able to back it up with facts, but I think generally it's dealt with very harshly. I think the, I think the punishment for, for petty crime is pretty tough. Um, I think there's a bit of a no, I think there's a bit of a, a sort of a low, there's very low tolerance for crime. Um, but I don't know if I can back that up with any figures. I'm afraid, but I, I, I should look into it. Um, I live there long enough. But thank you. Right, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So. Yeah, I have read a lot of uh, news about China and how it's uh, tackling climate change mm -hmm. in the last year or so. Yeah. And it sounds so rapid and so effectively done. Mm -hmm. And I'm correct if I'm wrong, but I think it's in one of the top 10 countries that is investing a lot in, in, in alternative energies. Uh, Can yeah. you comment on that? I think it is the country like the top country investing in alternative energy. And, um, you know, I guess we can't talk about everything within one presentation, and, but it is a fascinating issue. And I went and did a story last year in, a, in Shenzhen, which is this huge city down by Hong Kong, so in the far southeast, in the same province, actually, where the parents live here, probably two or three hours' drive from there. And this is a city that didn't exist 25, 30 years ago, and now it has 20 million people. Um, but I went to do a story there for Al Jazeera has this program called Earthrise and about the green energy infrastructure. And basically in the city, by the end of last year, 100% of their taxis were fully electric. By the end of, no, no, by the end of last year, 100% of their buses were fully electric. By the end of next year, 100% of their taxis are gonna be fully electric. And at the same time, they're subsidizing um, regular drivers so that they can buy um, new energy vehicles. And so all of the, the subway and everything else, basically, they're trying to make the whole city zero fossil fuel, and they will probably do it. Um, this country, sorry, this company BYD, uh, which is now the biggest e-vehicle maker in the world, is from Shenzhen, and so they're working with the government to invest in all of the transport infrastructure. But it, it is, it's pretty incredible. Um, and, you know, it was, I mean, China is a place of, as everywhere, but it's a place of real contrast. So when you used to drive north of Beijing, 
to go to this inner Mongolia, inner Mongolia region, on, on one side you'd have a traffic jam of coal trucks bringing the coal that they just mined in inner Mongolia, and on the other side you'd have a traffic jam of trucks carrying the blades for, for wind turbines because they're building all of these wind turbines on the grasslands. So um, you have this kind of very, very complicated, you have a very complicated picture, but they're investing in it massively. I just saw the New York Times had a video the other day about a solar paneled road, um, which is not something that people thought would be feasible. But um, you know, China has economies of scale and it has a lot of political will and it has a huge pollution problem. So I think when you put them together, <coughs> you definitely get results. Um, yeah, they're doing a lot on that, yeah. Um, we'll probably take two more questions. Okay. Did you see, even though the regime is so efficient and efficient, efficient and efficient, 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 effectively running the country, yeah. did you see any cracks where the opposition or, or resistance can come up? Did you experience any? Um, so, uh, yeah, what, I think during the period when I was there, it went from being probably the most open politically, it has been since the 80s, I guess, um, to being the most restrictive it's been. Um, and so, what, which, is, which is a very surprising thing, and I, I think it's quite surprising for a lot of people. It's very difficult for a lot of people to sort of understand. And, and it was very difficult. I think it was, we wouldn't have, I think many journalists working there wouldn't have predicted it either. Um, but so essentially when I was working there around 2008, 2009, um, you had the explosion of the internet. You had Chinese um, microblogs, which are like Twitter. Obviously Twitter's blocked, but everybody was on one. And all the human rights lawyers um, who were representing people who were the victims of, of official official abuse or um, corruption or, or you know, freedom of speech issues. They were sort of all tweeting away. Um, and some of it was being censored, but not really. And you felt like the government wasn't really, didn't really have a hold on it. It was this time when a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, the internet will break, will break the Communist Party. Um, because how can, how, can a one, how can one party control freedom of speech of a billion people who all presumably want democracy? But I think what, has, what we've been shown is that it's actually a very, very different picture. And I think it's not quite what every, anybody would have predicted. Like, so during this period, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, we could go and interview dissidents, people who don't agree with the Communist Party, people who would like democratic reform, um, or even the family members of people who were killed in, um, you know, in 1989 during the, um, the Tiananmen Square uprisings. You know, we, we, we could go and interview these people Sometimes we'd be prevented, but generally there was, there was a, a space for it. Um, what's happened since, basically since Xi Jinping came into power, is that it's got tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. To the degree where a couple of years ago, basically you had a large-scale crackdown on dissidents, human rights lawyers, um, where a lot of them basically were silenced, uh, were put in prison, um, on, you know, through, through a, a trial. Um, but some basically put it also just sort of disappeared. Uh, and that space is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think it's one of the, one of the great like, questions about China going into the future and, and for the whole world is you know, how can you have a country that's, that at the same time everybody's so much wealthier, at the same time it's expanding, and um, people are so much better off than they used to be, the majority of the population. Um, and they have the, you know, the number of Chinese students that you have studying in Europe and America, people's minds are being open, they have access to information when they're outside of China. And even if they're inside China, if they use something to jump over the firewall, you know, a VPN, which is a virtual private network you can use to get over the sensors. But, but um, I don't think, I'm making a couple of different points here, but basically um, I, I think China is, is becoming more, the, the, the Leadership is becoming more authoritarian just as the country becomes more influential abroad and more kind of international, um, which is a surprising combination. Uh, yeah, um, I think the space for, for those kind of voices is, is smaller and smaller. And, and I think um, the abilities of the, the, another very interesting trend that's, a, that's sort of developed or come to the prominence in the last few years is surveillance um, and the degree to which the authorities are able to survey through closed circuit television, through monitoring of your mobile app, through 
um, listening to, well, I don't think they listen to the phones of most ordinary people, That's a, that would take a lot of time, but they have the ability to harvest huge amounts of data about people through, through their mobile devices, just as, as uh, the American or the British um, governments do as well. Um, but um, but it's very, we're going to have to cut up. Oh, it's very effective. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, Max is still here. He's here with us all day. So um, let's do this. Let's stretch our legs and we'll start back at 11.35. Okay?